half past when Daniel will introduce our next speaker. Yeah, all right. <laughs> nice to see you all. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, do you think we have to we have to wait, or maybe we can start already with the second speaker? I mean, if if Edran is here, maybe we, we can already start. Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever, whatever works your boat. <laughs> okay, so so then let me introduce our second speaker of the day. So uh, he's Professor Vedran Dunico. After so he after doing several outstanding postdoc positions at the Institute of Theoretical Physics in Universitat of Innsbruck and MPQ. In 2018, he joined Leiden Institute of Advanced Computer Science as an early career tenure track assistant professor. Uh, his expertise focuses on investigating quantum machine learning and more generally developing the field of quantum heuristics, which promotes this connection between practical computing and quantum computing. So today he will talk us about new and old ideas in quantum machine learning and also how to go from this topological data analysis to quantum reinforcement, reinforcement learning. So thanks, Vedran, for being here, and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for the very kind introduction. I'm very impressed. I don't think I wrote any of that stuff. <laughs> that's that's very good homework. We do a lot of research. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's really really nice. Very flattering. And uh, I would like to thank Stephanie for the talk that she gave. I always enjoyed listening to her talks. I was there in the background, and she's a tough act to follow. I have to say, not the first time I had to go after such a such a nice talk by her. Um, and yeah, indeed, the topic is machine learning. I'm going to try to uh, try to share slides. Hopefully, that will work. Even though I have not had the best of luck with Zoom, so do, do you see my screen at, at the moment? Okay, there was a thumbs up. Yes, it worked. Is it still up? Very good. And unfortunately, I don't see uh, I don't see chat. But but if somebody has a question, like uh, smack in the middle of my talk, please 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 interrupt or, or or just you know drop it in the chat, and then we can discuss about it, about them later. Um, right. So. Uh, now, now it's Friday. It's uh, Friday afternoon, even, and and uh, I'm I'm afraid. I, I wish I could tell you that I have a very short talk with very few things that I want to share with you, uh, but unfortunately I don't. Right. So, but the upside is that I will, in all honesty, I will be presenting uh, two independent works. One one which has to do with topological data analysis, another one which has to do with quantum reinforcement learning. Uh, so, topological data analysis and reinforcement learning are two very different facets uh, or, or modes of machine learning. And, and you know, if, if you doze off in the first part of the talk and you lose it completely, you can start completely from scratch from half, half point on, or, or, or maybe you can switch off later on in the talk. That's, that's everything is gonna be, gonna be fine. Even though um, I, I will <clears throat> mostly be actually introducing the topic. So I'm, I'm assuming that not everybody is very familiar with machine learning nor, uh, nor quantum algorithmics. And I have to say this, this talk is going to be quite, quite heavy on the algorithmic side. So I'll, I'll try to go slow and then maybe if I manage to say something about what we actually do, uh, that I'll, I'll squeeze in. So yeah, so the talk roughly has three parts. The first one is sort of a big picture idea on what's happening in quantum machine learning and how quantum can be, you know, beneficially plugged into machine learning. And then the two other parts are about these two quantum algorithms, which, which highlight completely different aspects of the interplay between machine learning and quantum computing. One which has to do with linear algebra. As you know, you know quantum theory is a, a linear theory and, and it works in these high dimensional Hilbert spaces. And this is something that is equally a friend and foe when you're doing quantum information. The third one is a little bit different. It's about variational quantum circuits, which I'm certain many of you are familiar with or at least heard of, but I'll discuss this all, all, all in detail. Can, you, can somebody tell me, can you see my fancy red, uh, sorry, fancy green uh, circular pointer? If somebody can speak up, yes. Oh, very good. Yes. Okay, so yes. it was a it was a worthy investment uh, to get that thing. Very good. So the the topic of the day is you know can we get meaningful improvements from quantum computing in machine learning tasks and and interestingly can we keep them because funnily enough you can lose improvements. So the first thing I have to tell you is a little bit about what machine learning is and I, and I want to focus on not how it's done but rather what the problems are that machine learning solves. Uh, Canonically speaking, there are, there are three main branches of machine learning, two of which uh, are perhaps more famous than the third. First one being supervised learning, which is the basic classification problem. So I give you a bunch of pictures of cats and a bunch of pictures of dogs. So these things are, would then be called labels or examples. And you're supposed to devise a method which will distinguish cats and dogs and future pictures that you haven't provided beforehand. So this is a classification problem. 
uh, on the other side, we have something which is called unsupervised learning. Uh, now, this is kind of a tricky thing because it kind of suggests you want to do classification, but without the labels. So what we really do there is we learn features of the underlying probability distribution which generates our data. So if you wish, in supervised learning, we're learning about the conditional probability distribution of the labels given an image. In unsupervised learning, we're doing something more general. So you can worry about, for instance, clustering, like maybe I give you pictures of cats and dogs and you want an algorithm which is gonna independently autonomously detect there are two different types of pictures appearing. This is a property of the distribution of our pictures of animals. Uh, you could do generative models, which-, which Sorry, would... Vedran, sorry yeah. to, to stop you. So are you moving your slides? Oh, yes, and you're ah, not yeah, seeing my slides. Yeah, because we are stuck in the first slide. Okay, so this is a, this is not good. So let's try something else. I'm gonna try sharing, this, sharing just the window. Mm -hmm. But thank yeah, you for sorry, letting me know. This could, this would have been a- Yeah, also thanks to people in the chat. Very condensed talk. Um, what are you seeing now? Can you tell me? Uh, not yet, I think it's loading. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, this is a little bit uh, disappointing. Yeah, I don't see anything yet. So the thing is I do lectures in Zoom and there's an algorithm which says randomly stop sharing and start sharing a bunch of times that at some point it works. That's yeah. the best algorithm I found okay. so far. Now, now it seems that we can see. Okay. So you see this very busy about. slide with the, with the, what is this, Shiba Inus and, and yeah, furry cats some, and so on, exactly, right? Exactly, some cats and dogs. And is it yeah, moving? Yeah, moving, yes, yes. Okay, okay very great. good, so, so, great. so we didn't lose too much. So right, so we had classification, cats v dogs, we had unsupervised learning, uh, which is about, I give you a bunch of pictures of cats and then you're trying to somehow infer something about the probability distribution which is describing what cats look like. So a task would be, and I'm sure you've seen these things which are extremely impressive, like uh, you know, a generation of faces of people that don't exist. Like you, you train a model to generate people that don't exist. This, this, these are called generative models. One, one important thing in unsupervised learning is feature extraction, which is somehow trying to condense, uh, you know, condense the information which is actually relevant in the data set and, and forget about all the irrelevant stuff. So this is uh, an example of, of for instance, uh, dimensionality reduction. You go from high dimensional data into much smaller dimensional data, which still contains all the relevant information. Now, the third mode of learning, which uh, I will, you'll completely forgive and if you've never heard about, is reinforcement learning. This is a little bit different. It, it, it did get into the spotlight recently, well, relatively speaking recently in, in the last few years, because of successes of AlphaGo, right? This is a learning mode, which is, for instance, how how a dog learns to do tricks by, by, giving, by uh, being given a treat, right? You, the dog tries something and something works and it gets a reward. So this is what we do in, in reinforcement learning. We have an agent which uh, explores a, a task environment and time and again gets a positive or a negative feedback signal. And based on this, it's trying to find the optimal, uh, optimal strategy for its actions. And I'll tell you more about reinforcement learning later. Uh, for, for now, uh, I just want you to have this big picture and to have in your mind that there are three things we talk about. Uh, in, in machine learning. So uh, this was the, 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 the what of the machine learning. And, and now we can talk a little bit about the how. So the successes of machine learning critically rely on a number of central tools. One of which you heard in the last talk, which was a genetic algorithm. So clever algorithms, which for instance, can solve very hard optimization tasks, uh, even in ill-defined optimization tasks. Um, there are other tools that I want to focus on today in, in classification, so supervised learning and in feature extraction, for instance, in principal component analysis that you might have heard of. The, the critical tools are linear algebraic in nature, right? So, so linear algebra some, some, somehow gets you, gets, you, gets you all the way through to your solution. So principal component analysis is nothing but singular value decomposition, right? As, as I, I believe some of you may know. Now in other classification tasks, in reinforcement learning and in generative modeling, uh, another different kind of a buzzword you might hear is deep learning and neural networks. So this is a completely different kind of a flavor of how things are done. And, and they pertain to uh, how quantum computing can actually help, right? So for the linear algebraic methods, we can talk, think about using quantum linear algebraic methods which uh, in, in essence want to combat either the problems of big data or the fact that we want to deal with very high dimensions in our data analysis. And, and in the second part, we might want to substitute neural networks with something else, perhaps near-term quantum circuits and things like this. 
And these two approaches to how to plug in quantum into machine learning are, are really what defines the first part of the talk and the second part of the talk. <clears throat> so first, I want to give you a recent history of quantum linear algebraic uh, machine learning because it's, a, it's, it's really, really a roller coaster of a ride. So what do I mean by quantum machine learning of a linear algebraic flavor? So in 2008, Harrow, uh, Hassett, and Lloyd came up with, a, with an algorithm for solving linear systems of equations uh, on a quantum computer. It's now the famous HHL algorithm, which suggests the possibility of exponential improvements in terms of how long it takes you to solve large linear systems by really interpreting quantum mechanics as linear algebra in a very literal way. So as you know, quantum states, uh, the dimensionality of the description of the quantum states grows exponentially with the number of subsystems. You have exponentially many amplitudes, which you can use to store information in, at least in principle, right? So instead of dealing with an N capital N dimensional vector in, in, you know, in a computer, which might require something like N times four bytes to store, if I'm using just uh, you know, single float precision, I might imagine storing the entire thing in a single quantum state over nothing but log N qubits up to normalization. So my state vector is somehow uh, made equivalent to a data vector. Uh, linear maps are represented by density matrices, Hamiltonians, and unitaries. Um, projective measurements correspond to inner products uh, between vectors and so on. And it turns out you can do various types of linear algebraic manipulations of such encoded data vectors in time which scales polylogarithmically in the size of the data set under some very serious constraints that I don't want to go too much into. Um, and what's fun is that the applications for these things were found specifically in machine learning. So things like support vector machines, k-mean uh, algorithms, principal component analysis, and so on, were shown to be in principle sped upable. This is not a word, but I think you know what I mean, uh, to an exponential extent by, by using these quantum linear algebraic tricks. There is an underlying assumption it all works well when you have data already encoded in a quantum system in this fabled quantum RAM. And when the data is somehow living in a low rank, a low dimensional subspace, so it's somehow a low, low rank data matrix, which kind of fits well with what machine learning usually assumes. So this was great. And, and we had a feeling that we're maybe facing really a fountain of exponential speedups, not, not a few algorithms, but maybe really, really many. Um, it all started in, let's say, 2012, these machine learning applications, and there was really an explosion in 2016, 17, like there was a paper out once a month, I suppose, even more frequently, and a new idea how to use these linear algebraic approaches. However, it turns out that you can also interpret probability theory as linear algebra verbatim, so literally. Your probability vectors are encoding data, which seems has to be non-negative, but in fact, there are ways to work around it. Stochastic evolution of, of systems can be encoded in a linear map, uh, for instance, a Markov, Markov matrix. Uh, you can evaluate inner products by sampling processes. So you can uh, somehow process these probability vectors in polylogarithmic time as well. And it just so happens it also works well when your low rank data matrix is, uh, where your data matrix is of low rank. When you have a certain type of a sampling access to your data, which is even weaker than a quantum RAM, and it turns out that all these algorithms that we've seen in the quantum realm can be also done in the classical realm using just sampling tricks. So what we actually see is on a classical exponential speedups in essentially all the cases where we saw speedups uh, using quantum computing. And uh, this was a sort of a fabled thing in 2018. This, this, you know, quantum computing doesn't become meme very often, but in 2018 did. This was, uh, of course, you and Tang was essentially sequentially dequantized the bunch of these, these uh, proposals which were wrote about a few years before. So uh, yeah, so quite tricky for quantum computing. Why? Because classical exponential speedups mean that there's no quantum exponential advantage anymore. So the question is, why would you go do something in a, the, in a hard quantum way if you can do the same or almost the same classical? And this raises the question of, is all quantum linear L algebra flavored quantum machine learning decontizable in the same way or using some other clever tricks? And, and this is what we want to address specifically for the problem of topological data analysis. It was, not, it was not chosen randomly. It was the problem which had the highest chance of really surviving any attempt to dequantize. And this is what we'll be discussing. But of course, I first have to tell you what topological data analysis is about. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some intuition and we'll discuss a little bit about the quantum algorithm and our main results, which are in fact complexity theoretical in nature. 
uh, I will not go too much into detail there. Maybe that's not uh, to everybody's liking, but you'll see some things that you might have not seen before. So what kind of machine learning is topological data analysis? Um, so the mindset should be the thing that principal component analysis does, not what neural networks do. So it's not, not about cats or, or dogs. It's about identifying certain properties, some very, very uh, coarse grained properties of the distribution that generates your data. For instance, you know, in principal component analysis, you're considering a cloud of points and you're identifying directions of largest variance. You do it by singular value decomposition, but this is essentially the singular values capture the magnitude of these variances of your point cloud. So in a way, it extracts features of, of the distribution which is, which is generating this data, right? And principal component analysis is really nice and it sees shape up to rotations, translations and rescalings, right? It doesn't care about how your data is rotated. Uh, it doesn't care how it's been rescaled and so on, which is very important that, uh, you know, irrelevant things do not influence your outcomes. But sometimes you want to analyze data in an even more coarse grained way, where you allow your data to bend, stretch and so on. Uh, mathematically speaking, maybe you want to apply conformal maps or homotopies to your data. Like if I'm trying to analyze, you know, what fingers are on a hand, I mean, this is a hand and this is a hand and, and it looks very, very different from a linear algebraic point of view, but topologically, it's clearly the same object. So topological data analysis extracts topological properties from point clouds. That's what it does. Uh, so specifically, it's, it's almost, almost a very simple to explain thing. What it does, it counts holes from a solid object that you can construct from your data points. What I mean by holes, consider the stores here. Uh, it, it has one zero hole, which is the number of connected components. It has uh, uh, two one holes, two non-contractable circles on it. And it has one two hole, so one void, one, one three-dimensional hole, which would be you know, the, the meat of the donut if you were to bite into it. And, and you can generalize this to higher dimensions. And, and this is what you do in data analysis, you, you, topological data analysis. You extract a list uh, of these, these ever higher dimensional holes and you infer information about the data from that. Um, so this brings us to the topological data analysis pipeline, which does the following. It starts with a point cloud, which has an, some uh, lowercase n points in some ambient space, the dimensionality of which doesn't matter. It's not about high dimensional points. Um, from this, you construct a solid type object, which is essentially a graph. There are multiple ways of doing it. I will not go too much into detail how this is done. Uh, specifically construct something which is called a simplicial complex. I, I will tell you in a second what we actually need out of that. And once you have the simplicial complex, there's, there's an algorithm, there's a mathematical method which allows you to extract these, these call counts, which are betting numbers. And in principle, this would be repeated at different coarse grainings, but, but we will not care about that. We will care about this step, where I go from a graph or a mesh to a sequence of betting numbers. Uh, so what I mean by a graph or a mesh, what I really mean is a graph and a catalog which tells me uh, which clicks, so which complete subgraphs exist in my, uh, in my data set. And for instance, I can build a graph by simply putting a threshold at, at the distance between points, maybe Euclidean distance, at which the two points are going to be connected. If I do that, I'm going to get something which is called the Vitoris ribs complex. Now, once you have this graph, uh, a piece of mathematics called Hodge theory for us results from a guy called Ekman say that you can actually count these holes in a linear al algebraic way. Specifically, the number of k dimensional holes is equal to the k Betty number, which is equal to the kernel dimension of the so-called k combinatorial Laplacian. Okay, this is a mouthful, I understand. I will we'll break it down a little bit. But the point is there's some matrix called the combinatorial Laplacian there's a different one for each K, which is the dimensionality of the hole that I care about. And I want to know what is the rank, uh, what is its rank or rather what is its kernel dimension, right? How many zero eigenvalues does it have? So uh, this combinatorial Laplacian is a generalization of an adjacency matrix. Well, of a classical Laplacian, which is almost the same as an adjacency matrix. So this is what I need to do. To do topological data analysis, I need to compute dimensions of the kernel. Now, just for a little bit of a feeling what the kth combinatorial Laplacian is. Uh, it's a matrix which connects, uh, which, which establishes connections between k plus one uh, cliques of the graph. 
So uh, click again, uh, if you recall, is a connected, makes a fully connected uh, subgraph of your graph. So I would look at my data set, I would construct my mesh, I would find all the K plus one clicks and I will construct a matrix whose rows and columns are enumerated by these clicks. And then depending on whether these clicks are subclicks of a larger click or not, I would put a zero or a one in the matrix. It's, it's approximately how it's constructed. What is important to know is that it's Hermitian and that for uh, relatively dense graphs, its matrix size goes as something like N choose K plus one. So it's a much larger matrix than the, the size of the graph itself, right? It has, it has many more dimensions than the, than the data cloud itself. And when K, the dimensionality of the whole that I care about is scaling with the size of the data set, which is something that sometimes makes sense, then this matrix is super polynomial in size. But its interest can be computed by just analyzing this N-sized object, which is, the, uh, uh, which is the graph of the point cloud. And this is exactly, exactly what you want for, for a good quantum algorithm, right? It's, it's not about big data, it's about big computation that we have to worry about. So uh, summary so far, we have data points plus some distance between them, which defines a graph. From this graph, I can read out a catalog of clicks, all one, two, three, four, and so on, maximally connected graphs. This thing is then called the simplicial complex. This graph induces large matrices, which are called combinatorial Laplacians. And I need to compute the kernel dimension of these things. Um, I will not really care about computing the dimension as a number. I'll be computing the normalized dimension. So the dimension of the kernel divided by the total size of the matrix. And this I will call the normalized nullity problem. And computing the normalized nullity for these uh, combinatorial Laplacians is what I will refer to as the topological data analysis problem. So how do we do it quantumly? Uh, the best algorithm and the only algorithm I know for this problem is due to Lloyd, Gannarone and Zanardi, uh, which use some very, very neat quantum tricks to do this, this processing. So uh, recall that the combinatorial Laplacian is a Hermitian matrix. So technically it's a Hamiltonian as well. So I can do Hamiltonian simulation on it, right? I can, I can construct a circuit which implements the unitary, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, defined by the uh, you know, time integrated Hamiltonian. And this unit is going to have eigenphases which correspond to the eigenvalues of my Hamiltonian H, which is my combinatorial Laplacian. So once I have that, what I do is I choose a random eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. I initialize my, one of my registers in that thing, and I estimate the eigenvalue using quantum phase estimation. So these are two perhaps most fundamental algorithms in quantum computing, phase estimation and Hamiltonian simulation. Now I have to do this eigenvalue estimation to sufficient precision to distinguish the zero eigenvalue from the first non zero. So there's a, there's a gap precision that I have to worry about a little bit. And I just repeat this a bunch of times, every single time randomly choosing an eigenvector and I count the number of times I see a zero. And the frequency of zeros is, you know, approximating the actual uh, normalized nullity. At this point, some of you might, might be worried because I'm saying prepare an eigenvector of, of the combinatorial Laplacian, but I of course don't know these objects. But the insight of, of Lloyd Gannarone and Zanardi was that since I'm only caring about a random eigenvector, well, I, I mean, eigenvectors will spend the entire space, I might as well plug in a maximum mixed state because it has as a, as a resolution, a resolution in the basis of the eigenvectors. So mathematically, it's all going to work out. So prepare a maximum mixed state. I estimate the eigenvalue uh, of my Hamiltonian relative to the input of a maximum mixed state and see if it's a zero or not. That's it. That's how you do it. So the solution seems to be just run quantum linear algebra for estimating the nullity on the combinatorial Laplacian. It is not exactly so easy. There's some fine print here that uh, I don't want to go, go into, but uh, you know, be aware that there's, there's a little bit more stuff happening under the hood. But this is actually the, the basic idea. Um, so what does the quantum algorithm do and at what cost? It approximates, well, uh, note that I will not be able to find mathematical zeros, I'll be able to count eigenvalues which are smaller than some threshold. This is gamma. And I will be only able to estimate the, the normalized beta number, right? Because I'll be doing via sampling. So there, there's, there's an additive error there. So the, uh, the complexity of my overall process is going to be polynomial in the size of the data cloud, uh, quadratic with respect to the error scaling and, and inverse proportional to the approximation that I, that I worry about. Plus there's this cost which has to do with the fine print that I don't want to go into called uh, 
a random click sampling. Now, classically, the best things that people use is actually exact diagonalization of the entire combinatorial Laplacian. And, and this costs n to the k. So note here, I have something which is polynomial in n independent from the k, from the whole dimension that I care about. Classical algorithms do depend on k, and this is where an exponential separation can happen at the moment k scales, let's say, linearly with n. Very good. So now we know that classical algorithms for this are inefficient. Uh, simulating the, the LGZ algorithm is probably slow, but this is of course not enough to say that somebody will not be able to solve topological data analysis problem using some completely different algorithm, some completely novel idea which has nothing to do with what the quantum algorithm does. And, and this is essentially the main contribution that we've done is that we've connected the problem of topological data analysis uh, to something for which we can prove that it's a hard problem. And I see that I'm taking quite a bit of time here. So maybe I will, I will speed up a little bit. And, and also because this is, you know, very complexly theoretical and, and might be not in, of immediate interest for everybody there. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, there are the problems that we actually care about, which are the problems of, you know, computing the Betty number, estimating the nullity in a normalized way, and approximately estimating the nullity, which has to do with the fact that I cannot really get mathematical zeros, just very small eigenvalues. Uh, but the core of the, what the quantum algorithm does is it actually estimates uh, the low, sp uh, low spectral density, that is, you know, the frequency of small eigenvalues of an arbitrary Hermitian matrix that, I that they can plug into Hamiltonian simulation. Now, I choose it to be the combinatorial Laplacian because I need that for topological data analysis. But in principle, the LLSD problem, which is slightly more general than what I really want, uh, does this, right? Um, and, and this is what we kind of understand with respect to how these problems are related. Uh, this, if you can solve this low-lying uh, spectral density problem, so counting the number of small eigenvalues, then uh, under broad conditions, you can solve Betty number estimation as well. So this is at least as hard as Betty number estimation. Um, now, again, the, just to iterate, this is not really the same as topological data analysis. The difference is that in topological data analysis, I really care about just combinatorial Laplacians. But it is the closest thing that we could actually fully characterize. And our main result is that estimating this low lying uh, eigenvalue number is DQC1 hard. So, what is DQC1? You, this is a restricted model of quantum computation. So, in general, quantum computation has a register in an all zero state, applies some unitary, and then the question is is the measurement of the first qubit larger or smaller uh, than one half, bearing some polynomial sized gap? every quantum computing problem, uh, decision problem can be recast in this formulation. In DQC1, the register is not initialized in a pure all zero state, but only one qubit is in a zero state and everything else is maximally mixed. It is not difficult to see that uh, the, the situation where you have an all zero state is more general and strictly contains DQ, well, contains DQC1 as a special case. However, we have strong reason to believe that DQC1 is still not simulatable by classical computers in polar time. So uh, what we can say is that no classical computer can solve the LSD problem unless they can also solve the DQC1 problem in its own generality. Um, I will skip the proof. I just want to give credit to Fernando Brandao, who actually did most of the hard lifting in his PG thesis in 2008. But with his results, it's actually not that difficult uh, to, to, to show how, how things work. If you wish, you can ask me later uh, uh, how the proof actually goes. It's, it's not super hard. But then after, after, the, after this, we've done uh, you know, a refined analysis of the relationships of these problems. Now we understand exactly how they relate and when they're equivalent and when they're not. Um, and specifically, uh, the summary, the, the take home message with respect to the hardness of topological data analysis is if combinatorial Laplacians are a rich enough family of matrices, like really, really rich, then we know that topological data analysis is hard. We would need them to contain uh, some hard to simulate quantum models, for instance, that would be enough. That is that, that there exists a family of hard quantum models, those which are hard to simulate classically, which are such that their Hamiltonians are, are you know, very close to combinatorial Laplacians for some graphs. And, and since recently, this is like a few weeks old, uh, thanks to Chris Cade and uh, Kara and Houghtons, we kind of know that they correspond to pretty tricky, highly entangled uh, uh, fermionic hardcore models. So there's there's an increased chance that we actually may, 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 may be able to prove something even harder about how, this, uh, how, how difficult it is to simulate topological data analysis. 
So quantum topological data analysis is likely non-dequantizable. So it might be one of those things which withstands the attacks of Yuan Tang and other smart people who are coming up with ever better classical algorithms. Um, and, and this brings me to the sort of intermezzo to, to halfway point with respect to top quantum topological data analysis. So I don't know if there's an immediate question that I can answer because uh, now we'll completely switch gears and move to a completely different kind of a machine learning uh, algorithm, which has nothing seemingly in common with what we've done so far. But I'll try to bring it back uh, towards the end of the talk a little bit. Thanks, Vedran. So we have several questions. So first, sure. we have one question from the chat. So Jirigut is asking, uh, so if, if in, for instance, in these um, unsupervised algorithms, mm -hmm. so this unsupervised uh, machine learning, so do you have to hint to the algorithm uh, to distinguish these two animals. So it's just so, the, the algorithm, the algorithm basically going to categorize. Right, so so uh, this this is the question of the discriminative version yes. of unsupervised learning, though, which is the cleanest example is clustering. So, I mean, down the line at some point you have to hint something, but typically what you hint in, in, in clustering is the number of clusters. That's 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 usually the thing you plug into the system. How how many di distinct things? How many how many modes does your underlying distribution have? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we have another question from Arthur Christian, which is: What kind of applications can quantum topological data analysis be used for? Excellent. Can I show you that at the end of the talk? Uh, I have I have a slide prepared, but I don't want to jump to that right now. Yeah, I think that's that's reasonable. Okay. So we can continue maybe and then we can ask more questions afterwards. Okay, deep breath, purging of the mind, try to forget everything about topological data analysis. Uh, damn, no, <laughs> I still want to tell you one more thing. <laughs> I apologize. So, uh, it, it, but it's a high level thing, right? The, the thing is in topological data analysis, we had a mathematical problem, right? We wanted to compute these Betty numbers. And then smart people thought about it and they came up with a quantum algorithm which does just that. So this is the paradigm of problem analysis solution. But as you might know, in quantum computing, very often we're, we're in the opposite scenario. But also in machine learning. Like in machine learning, you know, what does it mean to distinguish cats from dogs? It's not something you can easily mathematically specify. I cannot give you a mathematical formulation of a cat. People have tried and failed, right? So you come up with methods which hopefully do well and then you test, right? So if we do parameterized quantum circuit-based machine learning, which is the topic we're gonna discuss next, we're introducing completely new quantum methods, which are not, you know, quantum enhancements or speed speeding ups of a classical method. It's something completely new. So it, at the face of it, since it's in machine learning, we have no easy way of saying whether they're any good, whether they're a good idea at all. And also the question of whether they can offer an advantage is not a clear cut question. It's, it's kind of difficult to understand what that would even mean. Because note, we're not asking about whether it's difficult to simulate the quantum algorithm we've invented. No, we have to ask ourselves, do there exist learning problems that actually require, necessitate the use of such quantum methods? So we're in a, in a you know, we're, we're a solution in search of a problem. And we have partial answers for this, which, which I will share with you today. But first I want to talk to you about really parameters quantum circuits. This is synonymous to variational quantum circuits, if you're more familiar with that term, and, and machine learning. But I will first start talking about, you know, uh, parameters quantum circuits without even machine learning. Anymore. So the key concept is the concept of a parameterized family of functions. So it's a set of functions. Uh, this concept you're certainly familiar with, it's, it's the concept of an ansatz in physics. In statistical learning and packed learning, you would call this a hypothesis family. And I encourage you to think about variational methods in physics. Uh, I mean, you're from Max Planck and you're from ICFO. You, you should have encountered, or you've certainly heard about matrix product states or more generally tensor network states, which are nothing but parameterized function families. Where, where the parameterization is in the choice of the architecture of the network and in the choice of the parameters you put in into each, each individual tensor. And how do you use it? Well, I mean, for instance, you're interested in estimating the ground energy of some physical system. So you want to estimate the expectation value of your quantum state specified by your parameters family relative to your Hamiltonian. And then to actually find the ground energy, what you do is you optimize the parameters of your, uh, uh, of your, of your parameters function family is to find the actual ground state. So this, this I, I believe, if you haven't seen, you will certainly see uh, in, in your departments. Now, classification and much of machine learning is not dissimilar. 
for instance, in the in the problem of, of supervised learning, so classification again, we're going to have a, a parameterized family of functions, but now they're going to be neural networks. So neural networks are just a family of functions which are parameterized by the, their architecture and by some weights which appear on the edges of a neural network. Each each individual node is a small computation. It's effectively an inner product between an input and a and the set of parameters, followed by some nonlinear function, and then you compose in this larger object. So it's it's a, it's a you know it's a bag of different functions you can use, and each one of them you can see whether it classifies a training set of cats and dogs correctly, and then you count the number of missed classifications, for instance, right? And then you simply optimize your bag. You, you go through your bag, you look at all the all the possible weights the neural network can have, and count the number of errors, trying to find the best performing one. So now you're fitting a function to do the classification job correctly. And this is almost it. Technically speaking, what I described is called empirical risk minimization. It's minimizing the risk or the error and the empirical thing, which is the training set you have. But really in machine learning proper, uh, we add another term, this, this R theta, which is so-called regularization term. What is meant to do, it's, it's meant to it is meant to penalize overly complicated functions. It's, it's meant to introduce something which is called parsimony or Occam's razor in your guess. You see, uh, in machine learning, the problem isn't to correctly classify cats and dogs that are classified, right? You want to be able to classify cats and dogs which are not in your data set. So it's the problem of generalization. And then you don't want to overfit on your data. And regularization is uh, the, the term which prevents this from happening in a systematic sort of way. Uh, now, uh, Going back for, to, to problems of ground states for a second, because they are really very, very similar. Uh, another thing you might have heard about is the variational quantum eigensolver. This is just an ansatz family where the quantum states are specified by a quantum circuit apply, applied to some fiducial, uh, let's say the all zero state. And now your quantum state is parameterized by the angles uh, of the gates which are happening in the circuit. This is essentially the, dura you know, the duration of the field of the, you know, the, the, the the relative phase of each unit you apply. And then you can evaluate the Hamiltonian cost. And you can, again, you know, in a, in a clever way, optimize the parameters to find, to find the ground state. So th this is sort of a cool idea because we know that quantum circuits can, in principle, generate states, which we don't know how to generate efficiently using, for instance, NPS or any other classical method. Right? This is the conjecture that there are states that quantum computers can reach that we cannot reach classically as efficiently. And of course, quantum machine learning with variational circuits, sometimes called quantum neural networks, is just you know plug-in quantum circuits where we had neural networks. So now my 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 parameters family are going to be quantum circuits where some of the parameters are really going to be free. So this is the thing that I'm going to optimize, and some of the parameters are going to going to depend on the input. So I'm fitting a function built around the circuit, right? But I'll train it in exactly the same way as a neural network, albeit perhaps using a different algorithm. But the idea is this, right? So far, so good. I'm hoping. Uh, may, maybe, maybe I will just say it immediately. And this generalizes like much of machine learning can be rephrased in sort of this let's optimize over function family sort of language. So we've explored this quantum circuits of machine learning in, in essentially all three contexts. But I have to say, reinforcement learning at the very least. Um, studied two examples in the supervised and generative learning case. Um, and, and since recently, there have been first serious attempts to somehow do something useful with them to see how they actually work, for instance, in, in CERN, in, in uh, reconstructing particles, particle tracks uh, from detector data, or for instance, in, in finance by, by somehow trying to learn the correlations in log returns of currency. So this is the question. Of, if Euro goes up, will Yen go down or, or not type of question. In reinforcement learning, we're not yet there yet with real world problems because reinforcement learning is much more, much more difficult in general. But the question you should ask, and I encourage you to always ask it whenever you talk to somebody about quantum machine learning, why on earth would we do any of that? Why throw away neural networks and put in quantum neural networks? What could we hope to see? You see, this is not about speed ups, right? Nothing is gonna be faster. That's, that's, that's not the game we're playing. Well, the, the key observation is that the choice of the model, so I apologize for the word model. It's a heavily overused word. What I should have said is a hypothesis family or a parameter assembly functions. They matter, right? So if you're doing, if you're solving ground state problem, if you have some information about your Hamiltonian and what the ground state should be like, you, you, you can make a clever choice as to what kind of an MPS or TNS or maybe neural quantum state you're going to use. Like, you know, if you have a local gapped Hamiltonian, 
uh, you know, then, then MPS is probably a very good choice because we know that they approximated well. But if you know that your system, you know, doesn't satisfy the area law, but the volume law, then you shouldn't be using an MPS. You should be trying some, with something different, right? And also we know that in, in classification problems, the type of neural network or in more generally function we use really, really matters. And in a non-trivial way, for instance, a neural network with just single hidden layer is already a so-called universal approximator. That is, uh, I can approximate any function to whatever precision I want, but just adding more neurons to the intermediate layer, just one of them, right? But, but actually deep learning is the thing which is changing the world. And by deep, we mean strictly more than one hidden layer, but probably more. And maybe quickly you can see in this little picture here. So this is a sort of the timeline from 12, 2012 to 2016 in a standardized test on unrecognizing images. Uh, the number you see here is the error rate. So at eight layers, they managed to get it down to, let's say, 11% error. Uh, but then to get to 3% error, they went up to 200 and more layers. So these are extremely large neural networks, and they're just improving the performance. And they're not overfitting. That's, that's quite an insane thing. So yeah, of course, our hope is that, that quantumly we can do better, that it can be an interesting family. So let me just try to give a very inaccurate and difficult to, to evaluate a specification of what makes a good model family with family of functions. They should be expressive, like you should be able to capture interesting functions with them. They should be flexible, that there are easy ways of constructing different types of functions, like what neural networks allow, you can build them up in different, user, different ways. Also tensor networks allow this, right? Uh, you should be able to regularize them well, easy to optimize. They should be somehow in tune with important families of real world distributions. This is of course a total wild card. We don't know anything about that. And um, well, almost anything. Uh, and we should be able to at least compute input-output relations, right? Now, in the quantum world, what we do know is that, well, they're probably not input-output computable by a classical computer, right? So they, they could really offer something that we cannot get otherwise. And, and moreover, we have now new evidence that there really are classical quantum learning separations, that there are problems that we really need quantum computers for in a learning sense, right? And we know that some of them can be trained. So. Uh, what we also know about quantum machine learning models is, this is advice to you, you know, if you have a learning problem, which is very simple and your neural network is doing extremely well with few neurons, don't try to solve it with a quantum computer, right? It's, it's simply a bad idea. It's, neural networks are so much different from quantum circuits that in fact, if one does really well, the other one is probably going to do quite poorly or rather you're gonna put in many, 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 many unnecessary parameters in the quantum model to get it to work. So use the right tool for the right job and we're really trying to find the right job for the tool that we have, which are the quantum circuits. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe just for, for, for your information, in the case you ever stop to think about it, I didn't really give you time. How could you possibly prove that there's a learning problem that a classical computer cannot learn and a quantum computer can? Uh, where it's actually not that difficult to construct one. So look at, if I can just draw your attention to the left-hand side figure. So each dot is an integer, and they're integer between 1 and p minus 1, where p is, for concreteness, a large prime number. But I can imagine them, you know, if I think of them with respect to the additive group modulo uh, p minus 1, I can, I can imagine putting them in a circle, right? And now I imagine the classification problem where I choose one line which goes straight to the middle of the circle, and everything to the left of it is red, and everything to the right of it is blue. Now, I don't know at which angle this line lies, and my job will be to learn whether it's left or right, you know, where, where the line is, or rather how to, how, to, how to color the points, which I'm gonna, of course, do if I know where the line is. But this is a so-called linearly separable problem. There is a line which defines how things are colored, and uh, these things are essentially very easy to learn. But now imagine is if, if I label the points in a different way. Even instead of using simply uh, the rule of are you on the left to the right of this to this to this line, imagine that I demand that the logarithm, the discrete logarithm of the point, is on the left or the right of the line. So in this case, without taking the logarithm, discrete logarithm, the points will look pretty randomly labeled. Now you may or may not know this, but taking the discrete logarithm uh, over such finite fields is actually believed to be intractable for classical computers. And quantumly, you can do it. This is uh, one of the two results of the original seminal paper of Shore, where quantum factoring uh, was also introduced. So in, in some sense, it's an encryption, encrypted problem. So it's a learning problem, which is easy if you know how to decrypt. 
Now, there is some technicality you have to be able to prove that indeed uh, the capacity to learn this random labeling is the same as the capacity to actually decrypt the logarithm. And this is what the authors of the first paper here, here do. It's kind of, a, kind of a neat trick, but it's also very contrived and artificial, uh, as you see. Okay, so now uh, I have still, I think something like seven minutes uh, until I'm uh, out of my 50 minutes uh, of time. And only now I'm starting to tell you something about reinforcement learning. But already you've seen quite a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping some of it was interesting. So you, even if this is all too much for you, uh, I, I'm going to be happy. So what is reinforcement learning? For, for a standard physicist, it is the problem of optimal control with feedback. So you have a physical system, you can tune buttons, you can see what happens and you're trying to tune buttons in such a way that it does exactly what you want it to do. But in, in machine learning jargon, uh, we will be talking about two entities a learning agent, which exists relative to a task environment, and it's trying to interact with the task environment uh, in some optimal way. So the environment has a number of states it can be in. It is very convenient to think of the states, for instance, as a chess or a go board, each different configuration is a different state. Uh, the agent can uh, do actions which change the state of the environment, like do one or another move, which leads to a different state. And time and again, a state action transition leads to a reward. So you can, for instance, imagine that in chess, there's some relatively simple set of rules which says, okay, this move means a win. And then you get a reward, right? But only then, not before. So the agent is trying to maneuver this environment, trying to find an optimal policy. Now, what's a policy? It's nothing but a function which tells what the agent will output, which action given a state. And typical in reinforcement learning, this is going to be parametrized because we're going to have way too many states to actually keep a table of these things. Um, and my job will be to find the parameters of my parametrized family, which gives the biggest returns when playing in, in, in this fixed but otherwise unknown environment. It might feel a little bit like supervised learning, like classification, because you can think of this as policies does nothing but label states with appropriate actions, right? It, there is a similarity. But it's actually quite a bit different, right? So in reinforcement learning, you, in, you, you gain experience in data and data by interacting. You have to play and there's a temporal order to it and, and so on. You do in the end want to find a policy which is doing well in things that you haven't seen before, right? And I don't know, Go has, sorry, chess is something like 10 to the 60 possible boards. I mean, if your algorithm has to see all of them to play well, then, then it's never gonna work. Go has significantly more than that. If, I don't know, it has, uh, I think 10 to the 300, no, sorry. No, maybe 10 to the 100 and something. I, I forget it has 360 something. Maybe 10 to the 308 possible board positions, in fact. So, so you can forget about it. You, you have to somehow generalize. You have to know what to do in a situation that you haven't seen before based on previous experiences, how things played out. So there is this generalization aspect, which makes it very similar to machine learning, but it's very different in that now the data distribution, the, my, my experiences that I'm trying to infer the best policy from, depend on my policy, right? But because I'm only getting information by acting and my actions influence what I will see. So it's not identically independently distributed. Then further the rewards, so this positive signal that I'm doing right can come at a very late point. Like if you're playing chess and know nothing about chess, you played for the very first time, at some point somebody tells you now you lost after 42 moves, right? Okay, so which one was the right one? What was a good move? What was a bad move? This is called the credit assignment problem in reinforcement learning. So somehow everything is also a moving target because as the agent improves its play, the entire environment looks different because it's exploring different types of different part of the space. And furthermore, everything is in general heavily stochastic. One of the quintessential model problems in reinforcement learning is the multiple multi-armed bandit problem. It's like slot machines in a casino and they have expected returns and one of them is the best but you never see the return, right? You're only sampling from the, from the distribution. And how do you know which one to play if you only have one night to do it? So everything is harder in reinforcement learning than in classification. Um, so there are many algorithms which solve the reinforcement learning problem. The main two branches are so-called policy-based and value function-based algorithms. I will, we study all of them, but I'll give you an idea how policy gradients work because this is the first one that we actually quantized. So in, in this case, you can think of a policy as being a neural network, right? It takes a state, produces an action. And I'm gonna try to find the parameters, these thetas, the weights of the neural network, such that the action is a good one. 
Uh, how do I evaluate an action? Well, I play the environment under this policy for a lot, lot of time, and I do it many times, and I get an expected long-term return, right? And I, I call this quantity V of pi, uh, V sub pi of, of theta, right? So this is in, starting from some initial state S. Now to optimize my policy, I would like to do a gradient descent or rather ascent with respect to the policy parameters. So I would like to compute the gradients of this expected return. And this is kind of tricky because it involves, you know, the entire trajectory of moves that can be played, including the transition probabilities in the environment, my rules and so on. So it's, it looks all very, very tricky, uh, but there's something called the policy gradient theorem, which we will not be discussing, just, just to maybe look at the last expression. I'll, I'll give you a second to look at it. So I have here the derivatives of the logarithm of my policy and some reward, but critically, I no longer have the environment. So in a nutshell, I don't need the derivatives of the environment. I only need to be able to compute the logarithm of my policy. And then by playing and sampling outcomes and computing something with my policy, I can actually value the gradients of the return. And then I can do gradient ascent in, in, the, in return. The, the main trick is the so-called log likelihood trick, which I, uh, much to my embarrassment, misspelled. This should not be a Y, it should be an I. Likelihood doesn't have a Y in it. So what do we expect and hope to see if the policy is quantum? Well, we know that reinforcement learning is harder. Maybe it's very difficult for neural networks and maybe it's the right kind of hard for quantum. Um, and, and this is what we started with our quantum reinforcement learning model. I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit because I'm now really out of time. Um, but it has, a, it has a quantum neural network, a quantum circuit, which takes an input the state and uh, the action is specified by the observable and the expectation value encodes the probability of doing one action or another by the agent. And otherwise it's embedded in a classical reinforcement learning scheme. Result number one, it works. We managed to train it on a couple of standard open AI gym environments like balancing a cart pole, maneuvering a cart up a hill where, the, where it's very slippery or using an acrobat and spinning it around in a given way. You can ask me later what it does. Um, it, it is actually not performing much worse than classical models. And recall this is again scenarios which are such that we know that neural networks do well, right? So a priori, they're not the best ones for a quantum neural network, but still they're, they're a little bit harder than a classification. And actually the difference between what a classical model would do and a quantum model does is actually not, not that grand. It, it was a surprising result, but of course it's not yet, it's too early to say whether the gap between, whether it's really an advantageous thing because it's reinforcement. Learning. Second, the deeper the circuit, the better the performance. And interestingly, the faster it learns. So it just improves. So green is at depth five and, and the blue is at depth one. So there's a consistent improvement by being deeper. And it gets close to, even closer to classical methods. Third result, this is a theoretical result, um, is that we can prove classical quantum separations. So we can construct environments uh, which can be fully randomized and semi-randomized and even fully deterministic where uh, a quantum agent can actually achieve near optimal performance efficiently. And contrary to that, if a classical agent would be able to do the same, then the discrete logarithm problem would have a polynomial time classical solution. Uh, well, you might not know this, but breaking the discrete log would imply the breaking of the so-called Diffie-Hellman crypto system, which is about uh, you know, efficient key exchange that would be uh, just as bad as breaking the RSA, which is the reason why there's so much fuss about Schwarz factoring algorithm, okay? And it's not that difficult to prove because you know previous authors who proved the same hardness for supervised learning kind of did all the hard work for us. But more interestingly, we managed to construct less contrived examples of environments which are based on a quantum policy where we could really benchmark the quantum agent against the classical one and kick, kick its ass, right? So, so it really does, for in these environments, we would kind of see a very nice, nice separation between standard neural networks and, and uh, environments which were tailored for the quantum neural network. This, goes back to this importance of choosing the right tool for the job, right? Now, this doesn't say anything about fundamental quantum classical separations. In fact, I have to tell you that we managed to construct classical agents, which, well, look like something that a classical computer would not have a problem with, uh, which do much better than neural networks, right? So it's, it's, it's really a relative statement. Yeah, and um, I think I want to really end now uh, by just you know, telling you that we still have many, mostly nothing but open questions in quantum machine learning, for any, and nothing is done. We don't understand anything, um, except that you know, it's a promising field. Uh, at least in some uh, very contrived situations, you can get a quantum advantage. It's, it's an exciting field. 
and and maybe it's something that near-term quantum computers could be good for. And and I will just end with thanking all of my collaborators uh, on these two papers here. Um, my students, uh, Kasper, Sofia, Simon, and uh, Chris Kate from QSoft, Hans Briegel, who is also supervisor Sofia. Um, and, and in the case you like this type of research, please get in touch with me or go, you know, look at the Leiden webpage. We're uh, now in a growth phase, we're hiring. If you want to do quantum machine learning and these types of algorithms on near-term quantum computers. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks, Vedran, for, for this super interesting presentation. So there are a few questions, and maybe we can ask them now. So yeah. first we have... Oh, okay, I didn't need Sorry. Sorry. So we have a lot of questions. There is one that was not answered before, I think. So from Arthur, uh, what kind of applications can quantum topological data analysis be used? Do, do you still see my slides? Uh, yes. Yes. OK. Do you see this? Yeah, so it's fine now. Okay, so so long story short, topological data analysis is a relatively new way to analyze data. And as I've argued, I mean, this is the point of the talk, it's classically very difficult to do, right? So it hasn't been heavily explored, but there are now an increasing number of papers which are using it to do, you know, to, to extract information from data that, that other methods have failed at. In, in things like spread of epidemics, how the brain works. This is actually something we might follow up on at a later point because it's an interesting thing. In population genomics, in uh, graph reconstruction, so this is maybe the least surprising because graphs are all about connectivity, hence, in a way, topology. Uh, also in, in complex network theory and, and application. Interestingly, also in multi-part entanglement, there's one fun work which studies multi-part entanglement uh, using topological data analysis uh, an analysis topics. And, and there are multiple ways to actually use topological data analysis as a pre-processing step or as the actual final outcome of your analysis, which you directly interpret. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot give you more information under any reasonable time constraint uh, about this question, so I hope it helps. I can give you, you know, I can give you links like the ones that are here. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so so the next question was from uh, Izzy. So is this empirical risk mi minimization something like the reinforced learning? Mm. Ah. <laughs> and then she says, never mind. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's a question out of which a difficult question can be extracted. Uh, but long story short, I mean, not in the way that I presented. It's it's independent one from the other. Okay, the next one is from Gabriel Fernandez. Uh, can the BNE hardness be measured for each instance of the problem? Can the uh, sorry? Can you can you repeat the question? How can the, how can or can there can the um, BNE hardness be okay. measured for each? Sounds was this question posed something like less than 10 minutes ago? Um, I mean, it was for 10. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's, it's a very insightful question. And, and, and uh, yeah, I absolutely, if I want to be fully formal, would have been extremely much, much more, more careful in saying, so no, absolutely not, right? If we're talking about complexity theoretical separations, we absolutely have to consider everything in a scaling picture. So we imagine a uniform family of environments which are ever growing, so there's a parameter defining the size. This parameter also influences the runtimes of, of the algorithms that you might want to use for that. And in that, that sense, you can't prove things. So this is the case that I had for the, where was it? For, for, for this, this uh, supervised learning problem that others have constructed, where the scaling is in the size of the, of the prime number you will be considering, right? So the larger the prime, the more examples you're gonna need and the more classical post-processing you're gonna need. And the classical post-processing is gonna scale exponentially with P. Whereas in the quantum case, it will not. It will only scale polynomially. With respect to this type of a thing, you're absolutely right. If, if I think your question was posed here. Of course, on, on, on one instance, we cannot say anything about hardness, right? One quantum circuit of a fixed size is absolutely classically simulatable in constant time, right? This constant time is whatever time it takes to simulate it, right? But of course, the point is that here we can systematically construct ever larger environments, right? And, and we believe that in these cases, things, things are going to become more, more tricky. But interestingly here, the classical learner already fails 
with quite a few parameters. We were very generous to the cl classical neural network uh, to learn it even at this finite size. So it's not a proof of any sort of a scaling advantage. This is not the point of it. It's just showing that there exist environments where classical learners struggle and quantum ones do not. And we have not really seen uh, anything resembling a natural environment where this happens before. I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks a lot. And I think we have one more, yeah. Um, so from uh, Gorbinian Koteman. So it's quite, so it's concerning the algorithm with parameterized quantum circuits. We know now that we have problems with trainability for large and or deep circuits. What makes you still optimistic about this kind of algorithm? Okay, so I mean, I, I suspect that this is predominantly com coming from the research motivated by VQEs and that we're talking about the Baron plateau problem, uh, which simply says that if your circuit family is rich enough, specifically the mathematics requires, you know, for formal proofs that it's a two design, um, shows that, that with very high probability, in fact, with everything except for measure zero, you're going to end up in a point where your gradients vanish. So not just gradients, but also neighboring points are going to be very, very close. So there seems to be no, no way to optimize these things. Right? When the problem of vanishing gradients also exists in classical neural networks, and typical workarounds workarounds around this is is by having prior information. Right? So it's it's not the case that we don't know anything about these these uh, circuits that we want to use. They can be constructed from smaller cases and then growing, which may give you a good good initial starting point that you wouldn't have classically. So secondly, I mean the fact that something is a hard problem to optimize optimally that has never stopped us from doing the best we can, right? I mean, most of most of practical algorithms, I would dare say, well, maybe not all of them, but you know, if, you, if you're at home in quarantine and you're ordering your food, there's some algorithm which tells you which which path the the, the, the guys carrying your food should should take. And this is this is the, the traveling salesperson problem, which is NP hard and no classical algorithm can even, even approximate it really well. But it still doesn't mean that there are no algorithms which in practice don't work well. You just have to be domain specific. And I think this is the key word to keep in mind for anything which is real world practical. If you're in a restricted domain, then you can always do better. Right? And this is why I'm optimistic that the more we learn about these neural, quantum neural networks or variational circuits, the more we'll be able to tailor our algorithms from on a case by case basis, not, not generically, um, to do better than, than black box algorithms would ever be able to do. There should be some papers coming out on, on certain positive results about this soon. But by the way, that I'm optimistic that this is always going to work, I don't know. I mean, I'm optimistic in general, but this is nothing to do with uh, <laughs> with, with uh, uh, deep scientific insight at this, at this moment. Thanks a lot. Uh, and we have one more um, from Matthias Bilkis. Um, would you explain a bit more the structure of the parameterized circuits to do reinforcement learning mm -hmm. to the measurements up here? How is yeah. the state of the environment loaded into the uh, quantum agent? Yeah, so I mean, the state of the environment is, uh, well, you, of course, there, there are multiple scenarios because you have multiple uh, multiple problems. So in uh, Cardpool, uh, Cardpool has a, a four-dimensional input space. It has the position of the cart no sorry it has the velocity of the cart which can be moving left or right it has the position of the of the of the of the pole and its angle and i suppose it also has the position of the cart right because you you, you can fall left or right and then you die so it's a four-dimensional input space a mounted car has a position and velocity in the two-dimensional space so that's that's the same Acrobot, I think, has six dimensions because uh, because I think you, you track angular velocities as well. I uh, have to remember exactly how it works. Anyway, depending on how many how many parameters you have, uh, what we typically do, well, in the policy gradient case, we didn't have to pre-process them. The parameters were already normalized between zero and minus one and one, and they're fed in directly as rotation angle of single cubic unitaries, which are appearing here. So there's a layer, uh, well, the first layer is in fact uh, variational, which means that it has a structure which has single qubit unitaries followed by a certain entangling structure. If you look in our paper, we study a few, uh, like nearest neighbor entangling with periodic boundary conditions, 
uh, without periodic bounding conditions and full connectivity. Interestingly, this doesn't seem to matter that much for these types of problems. Um, the, the input is just plugged in as a single qubit rotations, as I said, but whether or not the data is pre-processed in policy gradients, it's not in, in uh, Q-learning, which is something we're gonna put out, I think next week, we actually have to pre-process in an interesting way. It works much better. Um, and otherwise there's an observable. We've played around with a couple of them to find ones which work best. It's a hyperparameter of the model. Um, then you get expectation values and this gives you your policy. Nothing, we, we have, have quite a few insights as to how these choices should be made. Um, but that's that's a little bit of a longer story, and I would refer you to the paper and the discussion. <clears throat> Perfect. Thanks, thanks a lot. So now we have to move 